Hello, I am Michelle Rasmussen, the Vice President of the Schiller Institute in Denmark. Thank you very much, Dr. Isaldine Abu El Aish, for granting us this interview. You were here in Copenhagen on the occasion of the premiere of a film, a documentary, based on your book, I Shall Not Hate, A Gaza Doctor's Journey. You are a Palestinian gynecologist and infertility expert from Gaza, now living in Canada. And you chose that field because you want to bring life into the world. You have experienced deep tragedy in the Israel-Hamas war of 2009, and now also in 2024. Yet you were traveling around the world with a message of hope and reconciliation and have even been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize several times. What is your personal tragedy and what is the tragedy of the Palestinians? Thank you so much. I'm coming to book Copenhagen for the premiere of the book, I Shall Not Hate, which is my life story. And the stories are not something to read in the book Stories are about the living experience in order the people to learn from it and to live it. And there are lessons behind it and to know who are the Palestinian people. As a Palestinian people, for me, and as a Palestinian refugee, and that's important if we want to know, we need to dig deeper and to ask what's going on, what is happening, to learn, to connect, and then to act. Because most of the challenges in our world, they stem from ignorance, arrogance, and greed in this world. So as a Palestinian refugee, we need to ask, and that's what I learned, what is the meaning of being a refugee? Someone who has a home, who has a country, has dignity. In a sudden, to be kicked out by force, to be naked in this world, deprived of the dignity, of the privacy, Home is not for walls. Home is culture, is life. It means a lot. The only thing I don't want to accept it in this world to see someone homeless. Because when someone homeless is become, becomes disclosed to the world, there is no privacy, there is no life. And that we as Palestinians, we experience it during the Nakba and even now. The Palestinians are experiencing it in Gaza Strip. No nation has been tested as we have been tested as Palestinians. My life was a war. We as Palestinians, we are fighting on daily basis. Not because we want to fight in order to survive, to be recognized in this world. We love life and we want to live and to give life to others. Even in times of disaster during the war, the current war, the Palestinians are smiling and they got married to have marriages because they want to continue their life. And this is a message to the world to know who are the Palestinians. So that's why I came here for this message. From where did I come as a refugee? And nothing stopped me from achieving my the plans and the dreams. From Jabalia refugee camp, when I was a child, I dreamed to be a medical doctor. But the dreams are not just a dream and then they will happen. You need to have confidence. You need to have hope. When you speak about hope, hope is not just a word. Hope, you need to believe in it and you need to work hard to achieve it. Nothing is going to change spontaneous. You need to take action to make the change. So I dreamed as a medical doctor to be a medical, to be a medical doctor. And I worked very hard for it. And life taught me nothing is impossible in life. Nothing. I don't believe in impossible thing. The word impossible is not in my dictionary. The only impossible thing in life I believe in is to return my daughters back to life. But they are living with me. They are moving with me everywhere. 
as I said, from Jabalia camp to Cairo University to get my MD to specialize in obstetrics and gynecology from the University of London to come back to work in Saudi Arabia in many countries to be the first Palestinian doctor to practice medicine in an Israeli hospital. And that's important, the message. When I worked in Israel, I worked because I believed in the mission I have. Medicine and health are a human equalizer, stabilizer, socializer, harmonizer, and sustainizer. When I deliver the baby, no one can discriminate or differentiate between the cry of the newborn baby Palestinian, Israeli, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, the only cry in life, which means life, is the cry of the baby. It's a cry of hope. And we are happy when we hear the baby crying. It means the baby is alive and doing well. And they are born free and equal. Why we don't take this message to equalize between people outside the borders of the hospitals, even the women in labor. No one knows who is in labor from the labor pains. If she is Palestinian, if she is Israeli, if she is Danish, American, Canadian. And that's what I learned and that's what I continued. So I specialized in infertility IVF and then another subspeciality in fetal medicine and genetics always I want to achieve to make the things that match the needs of the people with genetics because I know because of consanguinity among the Palestinian people so I wanted to do something that helps the community and that's the medicine that's the academic education the academic education should have a human social healthy peaceful impact on the community it's not just we teach math and science we teach people to be human and to behave as a human. And the last thing which I am proud of, because I wasn't born with a golden spoon. My parents are simple farmers. They were kicked out of their homeland, but they believed that their children are the hope. And they invested everything in their life for education. So you see the Palestinian people are one of the most literate people in the Middle East, even in the world. And we are determined because someone can take anything from you, but no one can take the education from us or prevent us from being educated. And the last thing for a Palestinian refugee, how to go to Harvard. I was lucky to get a scholarship to go to Harvard. And the only thing which was consolating me when I graduated from Harvard, when I saw my colleagues, their families, at the commencement, all of them, they are there, but my family can't join me. But what consolated me is Palestine flag, which was raised among other flags. I said, I am here. I am Azildin Abu Laish. I am a Palestinian, proud of being a Palestinian among those who are coming there. And what I achieved now, I am at the University of Toronto, full of professor, at the university teaching graduate students doing a lot of research writing with a mission in life and that's what we need the people to have to ask themselves why are we here we need to have a sense of purpose by the end of the day we have to leave this world but we want to leave a legacy behind and that's my main goal to impact and to do my part as a human, to think of others in a positive way, because I suffered and I will never accept the suffering of any human being. Humanity should prevail and we should dehumanize, not to politicize. I don't have an agenda. The agenda that I have is a human one, not a political agenda for economic or any personal agenda and in order also to send the message to my loved ones to my daughters that your holy souls and noble blood wasn't waste it made a difference in others lives because in my life as a palestinian as a faithful person i am accountable 
only and just only to God and to my daughters who live with me. As you see, I see them. They ask me all of the time, what did you do for us? I am determined to inject their holy souls and noble blood into a vein of hope and the humanity in this world, which is corrupt humanely, morally, and ethically. What happened to your daughters? My daughters, it's happening now for the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. The same in 2000, 8, 9, the castled operation. I, I don't accept it to call it as an operation because operations, the surgical operation, the medical term, we use it to heal and to help mm. the patients, not to kill or to destroy or to damage. Operations, ethically and morally in medicine, is to improve and to heal the wounds of the people, not to damage and to destroy. So 16th of January, 2009, quarter to 5 p.m., an Israeli tank shelled my house and killed three of my daughters and one niece and severely wounding others. I didn't believe it. They were innocent people. I told them, my daughters, to be peace activists. I sent them to peace camps, to the States, everywhere. And the propaganda and the myth together with Israeli children. with Israeli with Palestinians with Jordanians mm -hmm. I believed in the role of young women and the importance of their efforts activities they were not human shields they were innocent studying if I have hundred of my daughters I am proud of them they were focused on their education the teachers were fighting to have them in their classes. They never succeeded less than 97% in their schools. They have their plans, they have dreams, and they plan it, and they worked hard for it. Bisan, who was 21 years old, she was about to graduate from the university with undergraduate degree, whom I promised to send her to London School of Economics. Mayar, who was 15, who was number one in math in the Gaza Strip, who planned to follow my path to be a medical doctor. Aya, who was 14, who planned to be a journalist, to be the voice of the voiceless, to speak to others. My niece, Noor, who was 17, who planned to be a teacher. I don't want anyone on earth to see you. What did I see? I wanted to see Pisan because I was there with them seconds after I left my daughter's room. The first bomb came. Where is Pisan? Where is Mayar? Where is Aya? Where is Noor? They were drowning in their blood. As the scenes you are seeing now, disfigured, their brains spreading everywhere. Mayar was decapitated. I can't recognize them. So, what can I do at that moment? When you see the loved ones, they are killed in front of you. They are the life. They are the hope. I am a family person. I deliver them. I deliver them with my hands. I gave the names. I wanted always to give them the best names, to be proud of them. So I lost, at that moment, I lost faith in the humanity. That's what is happening now in Gaza Strip. The Palestinians, on a daily basis, they are killed, starved, deprived of everything, and the world is watch watching. It's shame. When, as a medical doctor, when I see a bleeding woman, I rush to stop the bleeding, not to be watching what is happening. The world is ashamed of what is happening. If they can't stop the blood, the bloodshed, what can they do? Waiting for what? Waiting for what? To have more? Do we bleed as Palestinians? Our blood is different from others. We all bleed the same color. We all love life and it's time for the world for one time 
to stand for humanity and to zoom in and to take a positive action to inspire the world that there is hope we are changing we don't discriminate based on color ethnicity religion or background or the color of the eyes or the color of the skin that's the test for the international community gaza strip is their test what are they doing they are watching it and silence mm. in terms of injustice is injustice so this is unjust so at that moment i directed my face only and just only to god as a faithful person to god to give me the strength the wisdom to manage the tragedy and i am blessed to be a medical doctor to manage emergency situation so those who were killed i can't do anything for them so i focused on managing those who were wounded and the first message which came to give me support was from my son muhammad who was 12 years old while he saw me screaming crying in pain he said to me why are you crying why are you screaming you must be happy I said what is he talking about he wants me to be happy maybe he doesn't know I said how do you want me to be happy be sad my our aya and nur are killed he said i know they are killed but i know that they are happy there they are with their mom she asked for them because their mother passed away exactly 4 months before they were killed so i said if this is the palestinian child who is 12 years old believes in that he can teach these political leaders who are watching what is happening i said i don't need to worry about him and i have to continue my life because life as einstein said is like riding a bicycle to keep balanced we must keep moving i kept moving faster stronger more determined not to give up at all and not to forget my lovely daughters and the oath i gave it to them i will never rest i will never relax i will never give up and that's why I'm, why i am here till i meet them one day to meet them one day with the big gift that their holy souls and noble blood wasn't waste it made a difference in others lives but it's not with the bullet or with the missile it's with the wisdom with the courageous kind words and the good deeds these are the means because you as a journalist and what are you doing words are stronger than bullets the bullet kills once but words are more influential and that's what i am doing in my life that's why i am here and as as you say that um the tragic irony is that you had been an agent for peace between Israel and Palestine for many years uh, before your daughters and your niece were killed as a young man you worked on an israeli farm and you found out that the family was as loving as your own family and your daughters participated in the peace camps with israeli children you were the palestinian doctor in the israeli hospital and you were involved in bringing israelis to your home in gaza uh every weekend of uh, uh, once a month to to break down the prejudices that we we have for each other and you even wrote you hoped that the the death of your daughters would be the last would be and 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 you you chose the path you said now i have to choose 
Do I choose the path of darkness or do I choose the path of light? The darkness is poisonous hate and revenge or the light of taking care of my children, uh, the other five children and the future. And you hoped that out of this terrible tragedy that there would come a bridge to divide, uh, to that there would be a way of bridging the divide to find the light of truth that could enable Palestinians and Israelis to live together. Um, can you say more about what your mission is now? My mission now, and when I send my daughters to peace, and even when I worked at the age of 14 with in the farm, and it was the first time, because as I said, my life was a war. And war is not the soldier who is going to kill and to be killed. War is far beyond the soldier who is killing or killed. War is about the human beings, about women and the children. Women and the children, they pay the major price of any war. War is not what do we see on the screen. And you see what is happening in Gaza. It's not that the war. The invisible coast is far beyond what do we see. The wounds in the hearts, in the minds, in the spirits, which will be transgenerational, continuing, it's permanent. And always I'm thinking, what can we do with the consequence of war that the children will carry with them the whole of their life. You know, till now, for the last war, more than 32,000 Palestinians were killed. More than 74,000 are severely wounded. Gaza Strip, the most beautiful, and Palestine for me is the paradise. Gaza Strip was before the war. It was a hell. Described by the international community. Before the war, every five children in Gaza Strip 4 are mentally ill. Now, Gaza Strip is a ghost. You can't recognize the neighborhoods, the streets. The people are not the people that I know. A few weeks ago, they sent me the photo of my nephew. He's 24. I was shocked to see him. This is 45. This is 45, 50. Gaza Strip now is homeless, helpless, lifeless, foodless, waterless, childless, barrenless the most populated area with the population and the most populated area with disabled people, with orphans, 17,000 orphans. Families were erased. What can we say? How can we send the message that we are in the 21st century, that we live in a human world, that we want a world to be consistent with the human values and to prove that they live by these values. But this doesn't prevent me from keep to speak out. And that's what I urge the people to speak out. What is happening in Gaza and the war there, it's not there. It crossed barriers. The war crosses barriers, and you see the impact worldwide. It's not Palestinian, Israeli, it's universal. And we need the universal action, the international community to stand for once, for their own values, that they believe in it. The justice, the equality, the freedom, the dignity, and the human rights. Who wrote the human rights conventions. They were written in Europe. 
do they believe in it or not? If they believe in it, they have to live by it, not in a biased, selective, double standards. What is white is white. What is black is black. And that's what we need. We want to resume trust in our, in our international community. That's the guarantee for a stable, sustainable world. And that's what I am trying and will continue. I believe nothing is permanent in life. Nothing is permanent. And nothing is impossible. Everything is dynamic. And life is a cycle. We go up and then we go down. So it's time for the change. And I urge political leaders who are there representing their people. They are servants and serving the people themselves. And they should listen to the people. You see what is happening everywhere in the world? There is a divide between the public opinion and the political leaders. They are there politicizing for their own limited political interest or agenda. So it's time for them to have the moral courage to be risk takers, to say we are joining the public to achieve the goals of the public. Because in this way, they will save the Palestinians and the Israelis and their people. They will save the Israelis from their extreme destructive leadership to the Israelis. And also because any harm, the extreme political Israeli leadership is destructive to their people and to us as Palestinians. So we need someone who can say this is not good for anyone. And we have to intervene immediate, now, not tomorrow. And you had hoped that the death of your daughters would be the last deaths in this struggle. And now, 15 years later, it continues even on a much larger scale. And you said in an interview that uh, 20, last month that 20 members of your extended family had died. What is the cause of the spiral of violence? As a medical doctor, of course, and as you mentioned, I said it, if I'd, I could know that my daughters were the last sacrifice to be killed in the way to peace between Palestinians and Israelis, then will, I will accept it. But they were not. They were just numbers. And I will never accept any human being to be just a number or what they call collateral damage. Human beings are human. They have names. They have plans. They have hopes. They have parents. They have a future. They have life. And it's time to speak about a human as a human. Each human being for their loved ones is the world. Is the world. Saving one as if you saved the world. Killing one as if you killed the world. Mm -hmm. So that's why I will never accept it and will continue to advocate strongly for the human life, for the equality. So you speak about what are the problems. I learned as a medical doctor, in order to treat a patient, I have to have accurate diagnosis. And the accurate diagnosis is the truth, is the light, which guides us in times of darkness. Because once I have the diagnosis, I can set up the right treatment. So what do I do in order to have accurate diagnosis? When a patient comes to me, I take the history. Not to blame the patient, the history to know what happened and what's going on. And then I will do examination and to do some investigation. And once I have a clear idea about the diagnosis, I can set up the right treatment. As I said, it's the truth. Because Jesus said, seek the truth, and the truth sets you free. So we want to be free in this world. So what happened? We, as Palestinian people, we are a Palestinian nation. We are a Palestinian people. Not to deal in a fragmented way. When a patient comes to me suffering of his hand, I look at the hand, but this hand 
is attached to the human body. The failed doctor who is treating disease, we don't treat diseases, we treat human beings, the whole human being. So I don't focus on the head, I, this hand is attached. Maybe the symptom is here, but the pain or the disease in the body itself. So we need to deal in a collective, comprehensive, holistic approach. There is a Palestinian nation and the Israeli people there. One is occupier, one is occupied. One is oppressor, the other is oppressed. One has the power, the nuclear power, and the Palestinians, they don't have that nuclear power where the minister of culture, he tried and he said it, even uh, Gottlieb, she said, knocking the Palestinians with the nuclear weapon. And the minister of defense, Yoav Gallant, when he said, Palestinians are human animals. This is, these are incitements. I encourage the people, if they don't have a good word, don't say the bad one. Words, they hurt. They hurt more than anything else. So that's the diagnosis. We want the Palestinians to be free and the Israelis to be free. Even the occupier, he is not free. Yeah, but, but you spoke about this, the need to break the cycle of violence in terms of revenge and revenge counter, will never, yeah. revenge, and that there's action no... Action and reaction is not going to And help. that there's no military civilian. I said it clearly, and that's what my daughter, Bissan, God bless her soul, at the age of 14, she said, to meet violence with violence doesn't solve any problem. Action and reaction, this vicious circle is not going to help at all. We have a negative, we need something positive. We need to equalize between Palestinians and the Israelis. Not occupier and occupied, but the free and the free. Based on equality, justice, and the freedom for all. And dignity for all. And I said it clearly. We both, as Palestinians and Israelis, we are like conjoined twins. No one can turn his back. Any harm to one will affect the other. We live and ride one boat, and we must not allow anyone to do harm. We have to reach the shore peacefully, equally. And that's so I said it, the future, the security, the safety, the independence, the freedom, the dignity, the life of the Israelis is linked, intertwined, inseparable, interdependent, on the Palestinian safety, security, freedom, rights, dignity, and life. That's the only way which is a guarantee for a long-lasting, stable, sustainable relationship. Even the word peace, we are talking about it sometimes. Peace is not a word. It's not a word we are talking. We want peace. But no one is asking to dig deeper. What is peace that we are talking? And the people, they lost faith in it because they don't see it. Peace is a relationship, is a relationship between two parts. I have a peaceful relationship between you based on respect, listening to each other. We need to have peace between us and the environment. Do we have peace with our environment, with earth? We do harm to our earth. We do harm to our environment. Even we don't have that peace with the environment in which we live, so we need this peace, there are certain means. The peace is the goal, but we need the means to achieve this peace. Mm -hmm. What are the means? Yeah. Number one, respect. Equality, justice for all, dignity for all, life for all. Once we have these means, peace will be a consequence. And that's what we need to shift the way, not to start off from peace, start to with the basic requirements, the main foundation for peace, and then you build. The building will be peace, but you need to set up the means. Just to follow up on that, you, you said in, in your book, whereas the international community, I'm against rockets and suicide bombs, but 
also against shutting the door against the people who are suffering. I ask a decent life for Palestinians. Instead of building a wall, we need to build a bridge. But as a legacy for your daughters, Bissan, Mayar, and Aya, you founded the Daughters of Life Foundation. And on your homepage, it states, hate is not a response to war. Rather, open communication, understanding, and compassion are the tools needed to bridge the divide between Israeli and Palestinian interests. All can live in harmony and all can reach their full potentials spiritually, emotionally, physically, and intellectually. Why did you call your book, I Shall Not Hate? No, I called my book, I Shall Not Hate, because the people, after the tragedy, they used to ask me, and they asked my daughter Shada, Christian Amapur, in an interview, asked her, do you hate? So my daughter Shada, and she's 17 years old, whom also I sent to be scammed, she said, the answer was, whom to hate? And the people were asking me, do you hate? I said, why do they ask me this question? So I started to learn about hatred, to do a lot of literature review. And I came to the conclusion, based on the definition of hatred by the textbooks, they consider it an emotion or feeling or behavior. And the reaction to anything, someone who is exposed to harm, to hate the perpetrator. So I said, as a medical doctor, hatred is not the feeling. Hatred is not emotion or a behavior. Hatred is far behind that. And that's what I publish. I do a lot of research about it. Hatred is a self or community contagious, destructive disease, and it's the result of exposure. So I use my medical education, the public health approach, the epidemiological approach to implement it on hatred. So why the people, they want me to be afflicted or sick with this disease called hatred? Hatred is a poison. It's a poison which is toxic to the human body. It's a fire which burns the human body. It's a cancer inside. If we are sitting here and someone who did the real harm, a real harm, existential threat, passes by, how do you feel? Immediate, you become the blind. You can't function, you don't see. So I said, hatred disturbs the balance of the human body. You are not functioning well. You are heavy. You can't move. Your mind is always occupied in that. So instead of that, life is still in front of you. So I, I am a victim of the tragedy and the killing of my daughters. But I will never accept to be a victim of this disease called hatred. So I say to people, don't accept to be a victim more than once. Instead of staying being as a victim... Being a victim is a stigma. Bring all of your energy to transform the tragedy or the challenge you are, face, you are facing to an opportunity. And to move from being a victim to a survival, to a leader in this world. That's the message you send to the perpetrator, the antidote of revenge and hatred is success and leading and moving forward. And that's what I am determined. And uh, because my daughters, I believe also, my faith taught me, even this tragedy was for good. I asked myself why my daughters were selected, why I was saved. Because if I stayed a few seconds with them, I will be gone. There is a mission, God knows. And we don't know. And that's what the second day, once it was broadcasted live, the Israeli Prime Minister announced unilateral ceasefire. It saved others' lives. And this helped me. This satisfied me. It symbolized the war. And that's the other 
positive thing of that is the establishment of daughters for life foundation because life is what we make it always has been always will be it's in our hands you can shape your life the way you want don't let others shape it to you be yourself don't underestimate yourself without a blaming or shaming take responsibility and keep moving forward so daughters for life i established because in my life as a palestinian i am indebted to my mother my wife and my daughters the palestinian mother is the hero is the one behind the survival story of the palestinian nation women are the ones who give life women are the ones who nurture life women are the ones who sacrifice everything for their children imagine this world without the women and women are the ones who wage and spread love compassion and life they can breastfeed the children the compassion the love the determination the kindness that's why i believe in women give me five women in the history of the world who were behind war you can't find five but how many men you can find and we in this world women are men and men they were created to complement each other to support each other women are the beauty of the world so that's why i established daughters for life for education of girls and young women from the middle east and north africa without any discrimination if politics discriminate based on race ethnicity color or religion daughters for life includes all inclusive to all without any discrimination based on ethnicity religion or palestinians israelis jordanians syrians lebanese from north africa muslim jewish christians without any discrimination if politics divides daughters for life brings together and that's the message we want in this world because achieving stable sustainable world is the function and the duty of women women's education and to give women the opportunity and the role to practice the role they deserve and i am sure if they didn't succeed they will never make it worse as it is now so it's time to try the more we see women sitting on the table this is the hopeful thing um back to this about breaking this this cycle of violence um your daughter aya she said when i grow up and i'm a mother i want my children to live in a reality where the word rocket is just another name for a space shuttle and your daughter besan said in a documentary about the peace camp we think as enemies we live on opposite sides and never meet but i feel that we are all the same we are all human beings and you you have also stressed that the palestinians and the israelis are more similar than than different um back to this question about about hate the uh a, a very extraordinary woman who was the vice president of the Shell Institute for many years who who was in the the American movement civil rights mo- movement she said that hate 
it not only destroys the hated, but it destroys the hater. As as you say, the, this 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 poison. But it, you were asked when you moved to to Canada, uh, you spoke in front of a synagogue, and you were asked, "Okay, Doctor Abu Al Aish, but what do you teach your children about?" The, about the Israelis, and then what happened? Yeah, thank you so much for this question, because this is the perception and the ignorance, and when we don't know the people, we have our own ideas. So after what I faced, and I was invited to that synagogue where there were about the twelve hundred people, Muslims, Jewish, Christians, so from everywhere, they moved even the venue from one to the other. Because the number, even they can't accommodate all, and it was the first time in my life to take my children to an event. So after the questions, the period of a question, they asked, "What do I teach my children after?" So my answer to them, which is on the video, they ask. I said to them, "I practice medicine with evidence." So my children are here. So I called my daughter Rafa, who was nine years old, called Habib to Rafa, my darling, come here. Tell them what did I teach you during the war, where the bombardments are from everywhere, the house was shaking, under the fire. She was shy, and then she started to speak. And what she said, my dad taught us Hebrew words. The translation, "I love you. How are you?" And that's the answer, and that's the perception. Why this bridged us to think the Palestinian they teach their children to hate or to be angry? We don't hate anyone. Even our Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish he said, "We don't hate anyone." And we don't steal anyone, and we don't want to delete anyone. We want to be recognized. We want to have our dignity, our freedom, because the most holy thing in the universe is a human being, and the freedom. And we are deprived of the freedom. So I urge the world. The world is not free, by the way, as long as Palestinians are not, and they have to zoom in to understand that the world's freedom. Is from the Palestinians' freedom. Um, our partner, the Larouche organization, has recently released a video, the Oasis Plan, Larouche's solution to the Middle East, and it describes what the American economist and statesman Lyndon Larouche has proposed, uh, developing since 1975, the idea of peace through development between Israel and an independent Palestine through cooperation to develop water resources and other infrastructure. Because we think that we need to have a vision of a future common interest in mutually beneficial economic development to bridge the divide, a vision where Israelis and Palestinians could live peacefully together as a way of paving a path to peace. What do you think of this Oasis Pen proposal and how could a vision of economic development help create peace? It's an it's important element because you speak about economic and development. Economic development is one aspect of the needs of a human life, but we need development in the different sectors and different aspects. Like a building, I see the building, we need the strong foundation and the economy and the capital is covered and they are afraid. You need stability and sustainability, safety and security. Anyone who is going to invest an economy in Gaza Strip, can anyone now to go to invest in Ukraine? Can anyone go to invest in Ukraine now? No. No one will invest in Ukraine because it's not safe, it's not secure. If tomorrow to say to people, go to invest in Gaza Strip, what are they going to say? 
No, I want safety. I want security. So economic development is a supportive and the strengthening to the conditions that we need to prepare. And it leads to stability, sustainability, and building the trust. Trust is vital in the relationship. So the first thing you need, the means I was talking about in order for economic development to thrive, number one, equality. Because if we are not sitting at the same time to say development, I am down. We need to fill the gap in the equity. So there is a gap. So you need to fill the gap in equity. Then we move together equally with towards the goal of economic development that leads to stability, sustainability, and to turn the page, the dark page in the relationship, and to turn it into a brighter one with the following, really, values. Equal, just, free, dignity, and developing based without leaving anyone behind, not to leave anyone behind in a collaborative way and inclusive, not exclusive. And that's what I believe this can lead to a long lasting and the people will say that's the right, the shortest cut which can help us to move forward and to turn the page of military means, as I said it many times, military means and wars will never put an end. It only leads to more bloodshed, more pain, more suffering, more hatred, more violence, and more extremist than any time before. Can we turn and to understand even because we say never again, never again, never again. We have to learn. We make mistakes in life, but mistakes are to learn from them. A mistake is a mistake if we learn from it and not to repeat it. If it's repeated, it's not a mistake. It means we do it deliberately and we didn't learn the lessons. I hope October 7 to be the last that we can experience and to learn from it and to use it as an opportunity. And we have a moral, ethical and a human responsibility. Palestinians and Israelis and the international community, those who paid the price from the Palestinian children, the women, the wounded, the destruction and the Israelis, our moral responsibility to keep them alive through spreading hope, sending a message to them that you paved the way for this development based on the means that we are talking about, that they shed the light for all of us. There were candles burned for the future generations, not to be burned for a political interest because in life we have a priority the priority in life is not the past the past is to learn from it the priority in life is the present and the future who are the present and the future our children and the future generations we are accountable what legacy do we want to leave them if we love them, we have to learn the lessons. To inherit them a safe, secure, healthy, peaceful, free future. And that's what we need to work together. And it's not only Palestinians and Israelis. The international community should come to step in because there is an interest for the whole world. Because what is happening there, it's universal. Solving it, putting an end, it gives hope to the world. Trust in the international community and the whole world will benefit from it. There's also this idea of having, that you just spoke of, of having an image of the future. And 
determining what we do now to reach that future. We, we get an image. This is, this is our idea of the OASIS plan, but also uh, our international chairman, Helga Tsepp-Larouche, has often used the idea of a, uh, a Catholic bishop from the Renaissance period, uh, Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa. He called it the coincidence of the opposites, that you can never solve the conflict on the, the level of the conflict, that you have to rise above to have to find that common interest in which then you could the people can see why they should work together. And he even wrote a, 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 a piece called uh, The Peace of the Faith, Di Pace Fidei, to, to find a unity among the multiplicity of religions. Um, just just the, the, the end you spoke about in your book, you, you spoke about in your book, just as Martin Luther King, you have a dream. What is your dream? And what is the, uh, if you have any parting words for our viewers, and just before that, you, you spoke about your mission also professionally to bring life into the world. The Jewish people, when they want to say cheers, they actually say l'chaim, to life. And if we could if we could make that as a common principle to bring unity and peace among the between the Israelis and the Palestinians, to have that as a as a a, a slogan to life. But what is your dream and, and do you have any concluding words for our viewers? My dream and my hope that I am working for it, to see an end to the suffering of the Palestinians and to be free side by side with the Israelis, which I see it in a dynamic world. As I said, nothing is impossible. No one was expecting one day in 1994 to have Oslo Agreement Yasser Arafat and Rabin to shake hands. So nothing is impossible. And the world is full of surprises. So, but surprises are not just words. Surprises and hopes are, you know, values that we need to act for it and to see the truth and to understand without bias. And the world will benefit from it. And as I said, it. We have a lot of commonalities between both and how the only guarantee, my hope, to see my next door neighbor an Israeli Jewish, to live side by side as equal as a free and to turn the page, to turn the page of anger, of ignorance, arrogance, occupation, oppression, dehumanization, and to come together jointly, believe me, I see it. If we put our hands together, Palestinians and Israelis, you see it in Israel, the health system in Israel. It's built on the Palestinian Israelis. 30, 40 percent of the nurses, the doctors, when I walk there, how can my dream to see Palestinian children and Israeli children at the same school? at the same university as equal as any other nations. And believe me, both nations, they are waiting for this moment. They are resilient and they can turn the page. And I am waiting to see this happening. And personally, when the people, they say it's complicated, I say nothing is complicated. If there is a good will, there is a way. And we have to find our way with the support of the international community. And because it's the hope and it's the goal and the dream of the international community, without 
being indifferent, biased, selective, or complicit, but to be fair and to work for the rights, equality, and justice for Palestinians and Israelis. I say to you, the Israelis, the Israeli interest is more for and with the Palestinians. They have American Jewish. You are American Jew. Their close neighbor, who is the Palestinian there, to be closer to them and connected to them more than the Jewish in the States. I live in Canada. My neighbors are Jewish. So when I am in need of help, the first thing I call my neighbor. So they have to build and to strengthen their relationship as equal, free, dignified neighbors. That's the guarantee for a good life for all, where I value life and the Israelis to say, Lachayim. Thank you so much. I also, uh, I encourage our viewers to read Dr. Abu El Aish's book and to see the movie when that is available for you, which we will see this afternoon. And I also encourage you to register for the Schiller Institute's April 13 free online conference, The Oasis Plan, LaRouche's Solution for Peace Through Development Between Israel and Palestine and all of Southwest Asia. Thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Thank you Dr. so much. Dr. Abu El Aish for speaking to us and we wish you all the best to carry out your mission of peace and reconciliation and we hope that many people will join you in this mission. We need your institute to join us. <laughs> yes. yes, thank you so much. Thank you.